Good morning. Yes? Good morning. I hear me. <laughs> so sound is good. There, there is a handout for this workshop, so if you haven't gotten that, that's available in the back. And also yesterday, if you were in the fungal consciousness talk and you didn't get a handout, they have them at the registration desk, so there's more copies. So this, this is a talk, this is a new talk for me, so it, it's kind of exciting and I have no idea if I've edited my slides enough to get through everything, so <laughs> it's like jumping off the cliff and I'll see how far I get before I hit the water. Um, what I want to do here is introduce you to the microbes that are above the, the ground and look at the parallels between that web of life and the soil food web. It's, it's, it's often the same as, as what we do when we look at the parallels between plant health and human health. And, and I love finding those connections because we share so many different patterns and, and ways of, of working together. So th this is a talk where I got to introduce you to certain biological rules to get you thinking. And that, in turn, is intended to help you understand the nuance of, of foliar sprays and, and some of the brews I'm going to be talking about so you can match it to your crop. So th there's kind of a big construct we've got to get through to, before we get to actual recipes, just so you kind of have a sense of why am I doing this. Uh, and we're going to have some fun. So we begin by entering the matrix. The fungal, <laughs> I'm glad some people get this. The fungal and bacterial matrix, which we cannot see, but we have to use our imagination and our intuition to really access this. Uh, I'm going to have some pictures that are going to help us see and think about it, but when you're out there in your orchard or in your market garden or in your family garden, um, you don't see this stuff, but it's there. And it's there all the more and all the more empowered when you're thinking about it and working with it. So the arboreal food web, is essentially the rising of the soil food web. You know, that age-old adage about as above, so below. We're going to take that a step further and go with as below, so above. Because we have an understanding of that soil food web to some degree. Um, and the rules and the players are much the same. So when I talk about fungi and bacteria breaking down organic matter and protozoa and nematodes consuming those fungi and bacteria and releasing nutrients. Bring those thoughts up and hold on to them because that's the framework in which the context of this arboreal team is going to work. So this is where we're going to introduce the two new words for the day, um, if you haven't heard these words before. Endophytic, are bacteria and fungi that actually exist, live their lives within plant tissues. So just like mycorrhizal fungi penetrate into root cells, endophytic fungi and bacteria are in the stem, in the leaves, and throughout any plant tissue. They even get into the seed. In fact, it's through the seed that endophytic fungi and bacteria carry on to the next generation of plants. Another as the other word is epiphytic, and epiphytic just means on the surface. So here we're talking about the microbe communities that are found on the surface of the leaf. Just like me here in front of you, um, I sometimes ask the questions in my orchard workshops, how many of me do you see? <laughs> and, and the answer is, it's not one. I'm standing up here as a community of 100 trillion organisms. And my eyeballs are slathered with Lost Nation bacteria. My skin is just reeking with the stuff. And then in, inside, there are microbes as well, but they're, they're on the surface. Everything is epiphytic. Same goes with plants. And then another part of this notion is, whereas yesterday I talked about how maybe 5% of the plant kingdom doesn't form an affiliation with mycorrhizal fungi, um, things like beets, things like the brassicas. 
as far as we know, there is no plant that doesn't have some kind of endophytic within relationship, and certainly surface micro microbes can be taken as a given. So this picture is just up here because I want to really establish, I also don't want to reduce this picture. When I talk about epiphytic fungi and bacteria on the surface, that's reaching right down into the roots, and now we're into the, the rhizozone microbes. When I talk about these fungi and bacteria that are within tissues, they're also reaching into the space of the roots. So there's a merger. It, it don't make a separation between the soil food web and the arboreal food web. Another aspect of this is there are many, many players. So just as like when I talk about mycorrhizal fungi, it isn't having the one for a certain plant. It's there's many players involved. And there are names that if you've been studying and learning about microbes, you're going to recognize that, yes, I've, I've heard about them in, in this respect or that respect. Just like the soil food web does many things to engage to abet plant health, the endophytic fungi and bacteria do all sorts of things from creating plant growth hormones to um, just their mere presence in the plant tickles, induces a systemic resistance response to disease. And they also play a role, just like the soil food web, in assimilating, mineralizing nutrients and keeping that nutrient scene ongoing. So that's a big point, and we're going to play a little bit with that as we get into this. As well, these microbes also play, a work, play important roles in helping plants deal with various climatic stresses. So whether that's heat, drought, excessive rain, heavy metals, salt, just like the soil food web mediates that, endophytic fungi and bacteria do the same. And one way to kind of think about this is a plant can make genetic shifts. It takes times. It, it, it takes a new round of seed, a new series of growth before that really comes into play. Microbes can adopt, adapt a lot quicker. And, and that's why endophytic fungi and, and bacteria are an important player in the plant health scene, because they're there responding to what's going on in terms of climatic abiotic stresses. See, one of the things about a new presentation is like, I have no idea what order of slides. And <laughs> now I'm telling myself, if I just step back like two steps, I can see what's coming. I'm, uh, these are just presenter tips. <laughs> <laughs> so another cool thing to think about is, is the surface area of plants. I can't even begin to imagine what that number is supposed to, to look like. But <laughs> this is a huge potential for microbes to do all sorts of things. Um, that second point about these microbes are fed by either nutrients that come from the atmosphere or by plant leaf exudates. Um, that's something we're going to work with as well. Not so much the leaf exudates, but what comes from the atmosphere can come from a sprayer. And that's where we're going to use that tool to work to help support all these different microbes. So, here are some bacteria that can be found on the surface of the plant, but also within the plant. So Pseudomonas is, is a very common bacteria, and um, Bacillus, th these are names you know, lactobacilli. So what's important here is, because I'm talking about bacteria, I want to remind everyone that one of the things bacteria do is they create enzymes and organic acids that break down organic matter to provide nutrients in a soluble form for the plant to uptake. So, so we're fami familiar with that idea down in the soil. We're bringing these ideas up onto the surface of the plant. Now yesterday, I introduced another concept, and that is how fungi work with bacteria. So a fungi, through its hyphae, is, is reaching into new spaces. So right now, imagine that you're in the the stem in the leaf cells, uh, that mycelium is moving out there. With it, travel bacteria along the 
the hyphae, which <coughs> excrete those organic acids, which help dissolve organic matter. So we're going to look at what happens with these endophytic fungi, which are within the plant, they come out. And we're going to see how that ties together with what I want to get to. Now, humans, researchers, are always quick to point out, mostly they say endophytic fungi don't cause disease, but we don't know why they're there. It's neutral. So they, they, there's a real tendency in science papers to emphasize this whole idea of mutualism and antagonism, that these are microbes, and at any minute, they might turn into trouble. When you have that perspective, it's very hard to move to a space where you start thinking about, these are microbes, they're my friends. They're going to do something good for me. So when I read science papers, you know, th there's a really heavy, like, emphasis on a dismissive role of these microbes. And, and yesterday I said, with mycorrhizal fungi, we're in kindergarten with respect to how we understand how they work and what we can do with that element. With endophytic fungi and bacteria, we are not even in nursery school yet. So just establishing where we're at. One of the things that Steiner said in the agricultural lectures, he was talking about the tree as, as really like the soil arising. And, and it was from that passage that I really started thinking about arboreal mi microbes. And, and he ended that passage um, talking about how there's, there's no hard and fast line between what we consider the life of the plant and the life of the soil. Similarly, there's no ha hard and fast line between these microbial realms I'm describing now on the surface of the plant and within the plant. So now let's take a, a little look at how a plant absorbs nutrients. So we know they, they have roots, and on those roots are root hairs. Yesterday I described how if my arm was a root hair, within about a half inch or so, groundwater is bringing nutrients within my reach, and microbes in turn that are filling the rhizosphere, the space around me as a root, are helping to absorb and transmute those nutrients into a form that I can take up. But as a feeder root on my own, it's essentially a short straw to soak up what nutrients are available in that rather limited zone. Um, that works really well with soluble NPK agriculture, but it's, it's not a deep kind of look viewpoint for what biology really does. So somewhere in, a, in the early 40s, uh, Lady E. Balfour, went in one of her books, I think it was called The Living Soil, spoke about we have to get beyond this idea that plants just take up soluble ions, that they can take up nutrients in more complex forms. So that's a really cool kind of organic tenant, but a lot of us haven't heard about that. So I, I want to just explore what does it mean to have the ability to get nutrients with something beyond just short straws. Plants, cells, fungal cells, bacterial cells, all have cellular juice, protoplasm. That protoplasm is the means that connects all these different life forms, be it plant, be it microbe. And it's through that protoplasm that nutrients are brought and transferred. Because the fungal mycelium is there, here's that feeder root, now I'm going to go back underground, colonized by mycorrhizal fungi, its access to nutrients is now more like four to six inches around it. And when you have more and more fungi, the picture just gets more and more compounded. Similarly, the filamentaceous fungi on the surface of the plant and the endophytic fungi within the plant have hyphae and mycelium. These are the longer straws to bring in more nutrients. Protoplasm is the place where it's going to happen, both underground and down below. Excuse now, me, you mix what's the difference between protoplasm and cytoplasm? The question is about protoplasm and cytoplasm. So in my having had no scientific training, I wanted to understand that too. And I 
decided, and it seems like these words are quite transferable, but I decided that protoplasm had to do with the liquid space between cells and the liquid space just within the cell wall but before the cell membrane. And that cytoplasm refers to the liquid space within the cell membrane where the nucleus is. Now that, I'm sure I could be contradicted, but that's what I've tried to pick up out of it. I, I think the words are pretty much be interchanged. I, I, I agree. So this is a picture, this is, you know, I talked about we're entering the matrix, we can't see any of this stuff. But we actually have these incredible microscopic pictures that are showing us things that really are gonna help feed your imagination. So this is a picture of a stomata on the underside of a leaf. This is the respiratory opening. This is how the plant takes in carbon dioxide, which works with photosynthesis. This is where the plant respires oxygen, which is in the air that we breathe. And when people talk about foliar feeding, the conventional perspective is that you want to apply foliar nutrients either early in the morning or late in the afternoon when the sun, the temperatures start to cool or, or coming out of the night, it's, it's cool to begin with because the stomata are open. And it's thought that it's through the stomata that nutrients can be brought into the plant sap, the plant protoplasm, and thus shared and distributed throughout the cells. That's a very limited view um, because in truth, there's different openings in the plant surface and it's also not just a matter of applying at 7 a.m. and hoping it gets sucked in through those short straws by 9 a.m. It's an ongoing nutrient scene. So we're gonna to start to shift our conception of what we mean by foliar feeding. This is another presenter tip. When you have like something deep that you wanna to relate to people, but it isn't quite straight in your mind yet, you go to your book and you take a footnote and you put it on the screen. And, and, and usually I don't try to put a lot of words in one um, PowerPoint slide because I don't want you just reading. I want to like just make a point and have some imagery. But let's look at that stomata. Around that stomata, just quickly going back, are kind of gate cells that are kind of the muscle that open and close that respiratory opening. And those gate cells, in turn, have micropores between the spaces of them. So th this is another place where nutrients can enter even once the stomata is closed. And these, <laughs> so now I gotta read this. <laughs> these nanometer sized pores are lined with negative charges. That means that nutrients that are positively charged now I'm talking about the cations, things like calcium and magnesium, are going to pass through those pores, but not so much anions. So there I'm talking about things like phosphorus and sulfate. Now, in addition to that, there are also, now I gotta read the word, transcuticular pores through the cuticle. So now let, let's have a look at what's on the surface of plants between the plant cells and the world, the atmosphere. All plants direct fatty acids to form lipids, some of which are in a waxy form, and they form what is called the cuticle on the surface of the plant. Now, take this image and Im implant it in your brain because this is where all the epiphytic fungi and bacteria are living. When I talk about microbes on the surface of the plant, I don't mean that like those microbes are just like on a sheet of glass. I mean that they're tucked into all sorts of spaces um, where they can weather longer. Now, it isn't necessarily a hospitable environment. Um, and a couple of the reasons for that is waxes prevent moisture from coming out of the plant leaf so it can dry off r rather readily. That's how the plant keeps moisture within itself. This is also a place where nutrients can run out. I mentioned how these are microbes that exist because nutrients come from either the atmosphere or through plant exudates. So there are pore pores open 
through this cuticle, which is another means by which nutrients can get in there. And now we're also introducing an idea of not just a passageway, but basically an environment where microbes can not just briefly live, but persist. And when microbes form a community, there's always something going on to release nutrients. So we're, we're planting the seeds of an ongoing uh, habitat. And for me, this is, well, one of the things I do in my books, at least tried to do, is issue speculation alerts. The, here's a full-fledged speculation alert, because I have not seen this in a science paper. But those fungi, those endophytic fungi, which are found in every plant, there is no reason in my mind to think they don't emerge out into the cuticle. And a fungal hyphal tip not only exudes exudates to feed bacteria that it's helping it dissolve and absorb organic matter, but in turn it's through the hyphal tip that nutrients, in the case of mycorrhizal fungi, are brought back to the plant. So we have just radically altered the profile of what's possible from going from a simple stomate to telling, speaking, thinking how all this interaction has a place, a habitat, to do far more than most people think is meant by the term foliar feeding. But again, this comes with a speculation alert. Now, Charles Walters, who started Acres Magazine, the eco-farm movement, spoke about how plants that are getting balanced nutrition have ability to thwart insect and disease attacks. So when we, yesterday I talked about healthy plant metabolism, when John Kempf teaches everything that he teaches. He's talking about this. Let's get the nutrients balanced. And in John's case, he does plant sap analysis and comes up with lots of foliar recommendations. In my case, I don't, I've never done a plant sap analysis. I think it's really cool. I just never have a, like a budget to do it. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and accordingly, I understand the microbe community is going to process whole foods in a good way to deliver that balanced nutrition. So that's a little divide, but it's not really a divide, but it's, it's where I, I come from. So another principle I want to introduce just before we get here. You hear the recommendations to include things like humic acid and fulvic acid in your sprays, because that's good for plants. And what these acids are doing in part is are helping to keep mineral ions available to the plant. And the way that looks is like this. I, and I don't have to explain organic chemistry because A, I can't, and, <laughs> and B, it's not that important. But there is a double or triple bond where the metal ion is held in a form that microbes can get it and use it as opposed to that nutrient being locked up in a molecule where microbes can't. So, so humic acids basically are helping serve that function. So that all becomes important because we're looking to get these minerals and nutrients into the plant because that in turn is what's going to trigger the whole metabolic pathway that leads to the production of resistance metabolites, what some people call secondary plant metabolites. And I like to use the, the, for the words, the term green immune function for this, because there, there are parallels between our immune system with red blood cells and plant immune function with its phytochemistry. It's, it's radically different, but there's still parallels into what's going on there. So foods, things from the atmosphere to feed those microbes also stimulate the production of these phytochemicals within. They induce a systemic response. So the list is really long. It's, it includes other microbes. So things like effective microbes, compost tea, uh, come in under this category. It includes herbal remedies. So constituents and plants can stimulate a whole round of phytochemistry in the plant that we apply these materials to. That's kind of an herbal medicine thing. I'm using the constituents and plants to, to fuel my own immune system. 
I can use that idea with plants for plants, plants for plant medicine as well. And then minerals, um, be they sea minerals, um, specific mineral formulations, be they um, seaweed, kelp meal, not kelp meal, but soluble kelp. All of these various things can be applied to plants um, and induce a systemic response. Now, I learned a lot about this in, in a book called The Farm is Ecosystem, and maybe some of you met Jerry Brunetti, uh, and one of Jerry's principal, most pro profound things in that book that I picked up, and, and there are many, was the notion that you don't just spray, let's say, kelp, but when you use multiple me mechanisms to induce this response, you're going to get a much wider phytochemical immune function building that up. And so, you know, that's, that's kind of the basis of why do I make a mix of materials in my spray tank? It's, I'm going with this idea of multiple mechanisms. Now with that, let's go back to the microbe part. Those epiphytic fungi and bacteria is another presenter thing. I don't know why I do this. It's like, I'm up here talking and I'm supposed to be one person, but there's two people going on <laughs> and one is watching me talk to you. And, and I am having such a uh, challenge right now saying epiphytic versus endophytic when I'm supposed to do it. But I didn't have to tell you that because I'm supposed to, <laughs> supposed to look really smooth. But the, the microbes on the surface of the plant, the epiphytic fungi and bacteria, when that colonization is on the order of 70% or more, that is enough to totally change the prospects for a pathogenic fungi or bacteria landing into the midst of that habitat. And when it falls less than that, that's when disease has a chance to take hold. So, so plants are not just working within with that phytochemical response, they're also working with the microbes directly to have a defensive force on the front lines of where the action is happening. So the things that work against canopy colonization, some of them we can't do anything about. So when there is acid rain or there is high heat, a long period of drought, uh, deep cold, all these things are going to deplete the microbe populations on the surface of the plant. When I told you that I am a community of 100 trillion organisms, that's a pretty consistent fact because I offer a fairly consistent temperature environment and the moisture level is right for those microbes to con continue. But when you're a plant out there in the wind and the sunshine and the, and the snow and what have you, many things change the conditions that are out there. Then on top of that, there's the whole construct of industrial agriculture and what we do. So when, when fungicides are sprayed to prevent pathogenic disease from taking hold, they wipe out all the other fungal organisms that are involved, the epiphytic, the endophytic, the mycorrhiza, the saprotrophic fungi in the soil. And, and so that just sets up a situation that's worse and worse. When uh, heavy nitrogen fertilization in a soluble form is applied to soil, and the short straw method is chosen, that kind of shuts the door on fungal collaboration because plants <laughs> essentially say, I'm going for the junk food. There's a, there's a great parallel there in human health and plant health. I don't know why that happens, but it happens. And so that door is shut on a part that keeps balanced nutrients coming into the plant. That impacts microbial populations on the surface of the plant. And then that final point about limited food resources. This is, again, going back to that slide saying they're either, either getting nutrients from the atmosphere or from leaf exudates. Well, we can actually do something when we construct a holistic brew to feed the plant, to feed the arboreal food web. Now, this is a picture of the surface of a leaf. And this shows the underside of the leaf. So there's the vein of the leaf. Leaves um, have these towers, <laughs> which are leaf hairs. I'm, I'm not sure what purpose they serve. But, but in this picture, you can see the actual individual cells. 
And, and if, if you were studying it up close, you could actually make stom stomata out, the respiratory cells as well. And again, this, this realm of being able to see these things through a microscope is just mind-blowing. We're now going to zoom in onto the surface of, of one of those cells. And what you see here, when it looks like a pill, it's a bacteria. And when it looks like a floating cell with white strands, that is a, a yeast. Um, but, but this is what 70% colonization looks like. And when you're a microbe and you land in the midst of that, odds are high that you might get consumed. Second, you may not find the nutrient resources, the enzyme resources you need to cause an infection. Or, and this is cool, the microbes that are there, what's in this picture, are going to protect their niche. And they protect their niche by creating certain antimicrobial compounds, one of which we call antibiotics. This happens when the microbes are there. You know, the whole turn around and, and come into the industrial agriculture workshop, and I'll say you need to spray antibiotics to stop fire blight on, on tree fruit because I've killed all the microbes, and I don't even, even think about that. I don't even understand that. But back here, I like this. This is a new thing. <laughs> <laughs> back here, we're, we're understanding a whole lot more, and we're going directly to the source. So Elaine Ingham taught a lot about the soil food web and compost tea. I, I think of her as the goddess of compost tea. I never said that to her face, but. Someday maybe I will. <laughs> um, and she spoke that, you know, it's not important that we know the name of every organism involved. What's important is we just support diversity because those organisms know more than we do. Um, and I'm good with that. I've always been good, comfortable with being humble about it. I only know this little bit. And there's all this that is going on without me. This is what I call my NRA moment. It's not the sprayer that kills, it's what you put in the sprayer, <laughs> okay? And it is, is Mike here from Texas? Are you out there? When I was in Texas, I wasn't sure if I could get away with the NRA moment. <laughs> but we're suspicious of Texas, you know? <laughs> I'm not as suspicious anymore. I'm, Okay, so the sprayer is a tool. Whether you want to get out beyond that, that's up to you. But, you know, back in that other world, the sprayer, lots of toxins, I don't want anything to do with that. Here in this world, the sprayer is merely a tool. So one of the things I teach in an orchard workshop, and, and this is relevant whatever plant you're growing, is that there are different things going on in both the soil and on the arboreal plane at different times in the season. So, now we're going to start to get into the construct of, of timing. So really early on in the season, when I do a holistic spray, yes, I'm spraying the emerging, the unfolding leaves coming out of swelling buds. I'm spraying the branch structure, the trunk. I'm also spraying the ground. It's, it's like a pulsing spray to wake up the soil biology. Um, to a degree, it's, it's also putting some food for the arboreal microbes that are up there. In this part of the world, in the Northern Hemisphere, coming out of winter, you know, it's been cold. The, the populations are not that strong. They're about to come. The red portion of this curve represents greenness waking up, but also microbes arising. Now, that red curve is both about the arboreal food web and beneficial populations coming on the scene, but this is also when a lot of different fungal pathogens come on the scene. And so I'm kind of thinking about that in two respects. The green part of the curve represents what's going on with mycorrhizal fungi. And when I talk about mowing in the orchard or spreading compost, I know when to pulse the mycorrhizal system to assist the tree. So I don't care what crop you're growing, there, there's a same similar thing happening, waking up the soil system, the arising of microbes into the plant, um, diseases coming on the scene. As you go through the summer, um, there's, there's a pulse with fruit trees where there's a spring feeder root flush and a fall feeder root flush. That also 
informs me of certain timing of actions. But as mid-August comes on and buds start to harden, the fall feeder root flush begins, that's when a whole mycorrhizal thing is taking place. And, and finishing the season with supporting the decomposers is a big part of my orchard cycle. So that, that was just kind of a quick orchard lesson, but I, I want to implant on you this notion that these fungal cycles, these different portions of the curve, are going on at, at different times in the season. So let me introduce to you the, what I call the core holistic recipe, kind of the foundational part of my approach to a spray program in the orchard. Um, <clears throat> the active ingredients are going to be trace minerals, fatty acids, and microbial diversity. And we're going to get there by using four of those holist holistic elicitors I had on that earlier list. One is going to be different seed oils, primarily neem oil. Another is going to be fish hydrolysate. And I'm going to explain quickly the nuance of, of these various things. Um, seaweed, and finally some form of microbial inoculant. So the first, um, neem oil, is pressed from the seeds of the Azer Deracta tree that grows in a distant place from here. And India, Southeast Asia, Northern Africa, so, uh, Florida, Southern California, it can be grown. You know, it might be 10 years till I can have neem trees in New Hampshire. That's one of the pluses of global climate change, maybe. I don't think so. Um, but this is one of those things that has thousands of years of history in Ayurvedic medicine and agriculture. And I like it for three reasons. These seed oils contain lots of fatty acids. Fatty acids are a primal food for microbes, particularly fungi. So when I spray a tree with neem, and I'm thinking arboreal food web, and mycorrhizal fungi and saprotrophic fungi in the ground beneath that tree, or I spray my potato row, those fatty acids, some of them it's going to be absorbed by the plant, but mostly it's a food for microbes who in turn are going to consume each other and release nutrients they got from the fatty acids to the plant. So th there's this interim step, it's an ongoing scene. Fatty acids are going to fuel that. Another thing that neem contains are terpenoid compounds. So terpenoids are resistant metabolites that help induce that systemic response in the plant. Now you, you can get terpenoids from many things. This, we're not limited here. But one of the, the third reason is why I make this investment in neem. And when I'm purchasing neem, I, I also want to establish two things here. I'm not talking about a neem extract that you buy from the agriculture supply house, thing, products like Neemix or Azer Direct. Uh, in herbal medicine, you learn that whole plant medicine works a whole lot better than chemical extraction of one or two constituents. Those products cost a lot of money, and they're not a fair trade deal for the people who are growing the neem. When I, when I get pure, unadulterated, 100% neem, um, I say that 100% neem because you'll see a product 70% neem, don't want that, I want the pure thing. I get it from uh, my friend Usha in Minnesota, whose brother has what I basically consider a fair trade company in India, and you can reach her to get this product through neemresource.com. Um, there's other reputable neem products as well, but I'm just establishing the parameters there. But, but this third thing that neem contains are azer deractins, and these are compounds found in only one other plant, and I, I don't remember what it is, and it's very limited amount. Um, but these are compounds that mimic the insect molting hormone ectozyme, which means that insects that are in their molting cycle, which, by which I mean from egg to larva to pupa to adult, they're not adults, at that point they're out of their molting cycle, but in the process of going to becoming an adult, azodiraxins interfere with that, and they get locked in a juvenile phase and never complete their development. So neem has an impact on insects 
that are foliar feeders because they're ingesting the neem and plays a big role in, in limiting moths in my orchard system and there's lots of moths that get after fruit. And you know, I don't spray neem during bloom time because an open flower is where a bee comes, which is an adult, it's not gonna impact the adult, but the bee will take up some pollen and take it back to the hive and potentially build up enough levels of azoderactins that could hurt the development of the next generation of bee. I, I don't know that that happens, but I just don't spray neem on open flowers. I have another plan. Um, but this is why I like neem oil. Now, I've also learned to mix my neem oil in the recipe and make one third of it karanja oil. Karanja contains flavonoids. It's just another mechanism that induces systemic resistance. Karanja does not include azoderactins. So when I talk about my bloom time spray in the orchard, because I'm working to prevent fire blight, there's no neem, there's karanja, because it doesn't have that same ingredient. Um, and it just makes neem a little easier to work with. And, and yeah. Then another thing that I think will be really cool once we legalize hemp plants is hemp seed oil. Hemp seed oil is probably has the most ideal saturated fat content of any seed oil. And not only am I talking about omega-3s and 6s for our human purposes, plants utilize those oils, fats as well. But I'm talking also about when we get into the linoleic and the oleic and other assorted oils that are good for plants. So the unsaturated oils are ideal where the saturated fats cause more issues, just like with us. It's, it's the same thing. But if we're growing lots and lots of hemp, because it, it makes so much sense, that seed oil should become reasonably priced for agricultural use. So hang on to that thought. Now, when I say fish hydrolysate, I am referring to un, um, cold processed fish, not necessarily the whole fish. The fillet may have been removed, um, depending on the species, but it still has the oil content. The oils were not removed to make fish oil capsules for you to buy in the health food store or some other purpose. And it's those oils, fats, along with enzymes and hormones that make a liquid fish product what I want for the microbes. And when we talk liquid fish, it is considered to be a fertilizer, so it is labeled with a, the NPK numbers, um, three numbers with hyphens between, and the first number represents the nitrogen content. When that number is two or three, you are getting a true fish hydrolysate. I'm, I'm telling you this because it's very easy to call fish emulsion liquid fish. It's a liquid form of fish fertilizer. But fish emulsion had the oils removed. It was heated, it was processed. The enzymes and hormones were destroyed. And some companies make a spiel that sounds like you're getting what you want. But look at that NPK number. Two or three is right. Four or five is gonna be fish emulsion. And sometimes you'll even see a number like 15, which has been spiked with some kind of chemical nitrogen. So when you talk to people from Neptune's Harvest, who is here, or Organic Gem, or Schaefer's Fish, or Dram out in the Midwest, or I think it's Pacific Nutrients um, out on the West Coast, those are the right people. That's where you're getting fish hydrolysate from. Kelp. Kelp can come in either as a dried extract or in a liquid form. So the liquid form has been cold processed. I consider the two interchangeable. I, I think of seaweed as a mega multivitamin because it has lots of nutrients. I also know that the cytokinins in seaweed, in the kelp plant, are very useful for stimulating the flavonoid pathway, the part of induced systemic resistance. But the one difference between cold processed kelp, liquid kelp, and the seaweed extract is the polysaccharide content gets lost when the seaweed is dried. And polysaccharides can be a useful tool in that if you are in bloom time, 
with your plant, maybe to a slight degree with tomatoes and potatoes if, if frost is threatening, because those sugars act as a plant antifreeze and they increase cold tolerance by two to four degrees. So I, I typically buy seaweed extract in bulk because I'm having things like this shipped to me and that just is a lot more sensible. But when I get by, get, go to Maine to talk, I stop by Organic Growers Supply Fedco and pick up one or two five gallon buckets of liquid seaweed just so I have it if we're coming into bloom time and they're talking about temperatures dropping down into the mid high 20s. With apple flowers at 28 degrees, you only lose 10% of those blooms. Drop the temperature three degrees, 25, and you lose 90%. And you can see, do the math, two to four degrees of cold tolerance can make the big difference. Do you have a question? Is there any form of seaweed that's better than another? Like for what we're talking about, like kelp versus eelgrass versus we happen to live near the ocean, so we use eelgrass. So the, the, the question is, is any form better? I, I don't know that answer. I, I know that kelp delivers what I'm talking about. Um, I know that some product people will talk about this seaweed has got something extra, extra special, <laughs> yeah. but I, I don't know that part. Yes? I think it's on the order, I have to look it up. I, I have a 100 gallon spray tank and I think I'm putting a, it's either a half gallon or a gallon when I do that. I, I, it's in the book, but I can also answer that if you email me. <laughs> I don't have that fact in front of me. That's another presenter tip. Always admit when you don't know something or just you're totally confused. <laughs> <laughs> yes. See, now I edited out those slides um, <laughs> and I didn't teach you the practicalities of seed oil. So a seed oil needs to be emulsified in order to become, mix out in a batch of water, otherwise you're going to have an oil puddle on the top. And by emulsifying, at its simplest, it just simply means when I mix a half gallon of neem and karanja oil into that 100 gallons of water, I require a quarter cup of soap and I use a biodegradable liquid soap like Ecover or 7th generation. If, if you use a weaker soap like Dr. Bonner's, you have to use more, but that quarter cup stirred into the oil before I put it into the water makes the molecules of the oil disperse once it goes in the water. And another aspect of this is if you have hard water, you have to soften it because that undoes the action of the soap. So I'll just leave that at that. I could talk more on that, but I want to get through these other things. Just quickly, if you could talk about, can you comment on the uh, OGS uh, fish hydrolysis product? Is that a pretty good fish hydrolysis? If you know. I think the answer is yes. I, 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 I get it by the 55 gallon drum, so I haven't been buying their fish. One last question, Mike, and then I'm going to shut you all off because I'm no longer comfortable with this. <laughs> Steiner's teaching about the bark being more akin to earth than plant is the answer. So there's a bark food web. <laughs> um, yes, I, I, I mentioned this. The flavonoids are also important in the whole protein synthesis thing, so that, that's a good thing. When it comes to biological reinforcement, um, you can purchase inoculum. Now I'm talking about effective microorganisms, uh, what's known as EM, and this is something that I get from Terraganics. There's a company in St. Louis called SCD Probiotics. I'm sure there's others. Um, I'm gonna get a little more into what that is. You can derive this from compost, the idea of compost tea. If your thing is Korean natural farming and you want to work with indigenous microbes, there's techniques to do that, but this is an important part of the recipe, whatever you're doing, because those microbes are how you're re-establishing that 70% colonization. And I just threw this slide in because I, I find it interesting. We're, we're starting to hear about more and more 
products, you know, for fire blight or for dealing with citrus canker, and I don't know the vegetable analogies here, but these are microbes, and just because, or something like Blossom Protect, just because a company isolates one or two microbes and says this will form a bacterial phage over the surface of your, your leaf, that's great, but they're just, we got the whole picture, and, and we can work a little more directly than necessarily paying for that. So now we need to learn just a little bit about how disease works, and then we get into brewing. Um, again, it's an invisible world, and you've got a mortgage to pay. You've got to deliver a crop that grades out so that you make enough money. You can't see it, and so, you know, to fall that into the hole, the rabbit hole, of what can I spray to change this disease from even showing up, well, that path began somewhere in the mid-1800s, and it, it began with pissed off grope grayers, grope, <laughs> gropers in France, <laughs> grape growers in France, <laughs> who were tired of people just going into their vineyards and taking their crops, so they just said, screw them, and sprayed the grapevines with copper sulfate. And then they recognized, hey, we're not having the same mildew issues or, or whatever it was. And so that launched the whole thing. And, and we went from there to uh, working with sulfur, and then we discovered the EBD fungicides and the systemic fungicides in use today. And it, it, it all flowed from this one mindset. And, and here's another one of these human analogies, plant analogies, that we need to clean the slate. And by cleaning the slate, we destroy the pathogen. We, we toxify the environment or make a direct hit on that organism so it can't cause disease. And when you clean the slate, what have we just been talking about? What's the slate consist of? Endophytic fungi and, and epiphytic fungi that do all these wonderful things, they're gone. When you opt for antibiotics in human medicine, and there are instances that that makes sense, you clean the slate and you're set up for potentially serious issues, especially if you're in a hospital setting because you're a sitting duck for a pathogen to take hold. Um, when we talk about disease, I have to get into the life cycle of a specific pathogen to understand two things. And I'm not gonna get into the specifics of apple scab with you here, but I just wanna make that point that you're, you're looking at what's going on with the disease that is of particular challenge for my crop and my place. And I'm looking to learn about its launching pad. Where does it come from? So in the case of apple scab, last year's leaves are where a scab pseudothethia spore sacs are formed. And then when it rains in the spring, from about pre-bloom till 10 or so days after fruit set, after what we call petal fall, those spores land on the leaf and cause a new round of infection. So the more I can get those leaves to decompose and not be there, the better off I am at the start of the season. If you're, if you're a potato, tomato grower, you harvest your crop, you don't leave plant residues to the extent that you can get rid of them out there in the garden because that's where the disease is gonna come from the next year. And then the other aspect is what's the timing? I, I just said with scab, it's happening when tissue first shows going into bloom to about 10 days after petal fall. There, there is a timing for whatever your disease challenge is. Now when we talk about disease, we can kind of just think of the whole thing as preemptive, but again, depending on the crop you're growing, you can have issues that you need to deal with because your living is aligned with this. You have to understand it a little bit more. Um, biotrophic fungal diseases are what cause spotting, and mildew is included in this, rust is included in this, scab is included in this. And you don't have to be a fruit grower to be dealing with those diseases. Um, and, and when a spore lands on the surface of a plant, it produces enzymes, it, it's a fungus, it grows a hyphae, and it has to punch its way through there. And, and there's this fascinating thing about the plant phytochemistry that's being produced to resist that. And don't forget all your 
fellow epiphytic microbes that are also saying, nope, there's no room at the inn here. So there's, there's a lot to be learned there. Um, but that action is what we're going to try to help the plant side counter with these holistic sprays. So in orcharding, I divide the season into windows. And vegetables, and, and <laughs> orcharding is a lot harder than growing vegetables. Okay, and it just is, because it is. And <laughs> these windows are, are like the fungal curve. They help me to think about primary infection window. When tissue is young and tender, think about the spotting diseases. When I come into the fruit sizing window, lots of things are going on, but this is when rots are setting up to get onto the scene. And when the fruit is actually starting to ripen and sweeten, I know that the rots are going to really take hold. So very quickly, I just described kind of a cascade of <laughs> different disease potential. But remember, we're no longer fearful. But <laughs> spotting diseases have a time, and then the rots come on. And so I have to be thinking about making sure what I'm doing for the plants is appropriate for what I'm facing. OK, we're gonna, we are going to start cooking. <laughs> um, Unlike giving you a sp specific mineral formulation um, to a bet plant, plant healthy plant metabolism, I'm going to approach a lot of this more in a general way, and I'm going to look to use plants and remedies that come from my ecosystem. And you know, just as in terms of, of the soil, you know, when I buy kelp meal and feed it to the sheep, and they poop, and I take the manure and I make compost, I get some benefit from that kelp on the other end as well. When I make my compost piles and sprinkle the, a layer now and then with azomite clay, um, I'm using a soil amendment which has all the trace minerals from A to Z. Minerals are important because they serve as enzyme cofactors which just help speed along the metabolic pathway of plants. You know, I learned this from John Kempf and, and, and um, this whole notion of having a good array of things like cobalt and zinc and molybdenum. Here's another presenter tip. Three years ago, I wouldn't have even tried to say molybdenum in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm risking it when I just tell you that, because then I'll probably go back to my blurred, stuttering ways. Um, those things are important, because it helps photosynthesis efficiency, which in turn helps protein synthesis, which leads to the production of more fatty acids, lipid compounds by the plant. So I know that. I want to do it. And I want to understand when it has relevance. And that relevance, the uh, metabolic points of influence, really come down to when the plant is doing a lot of things. So if, if you're, again, my reference point is apple trees. <laughs> if you are going into bloom, you're doing something. That's an important time to maybe include some trace minerals in, in what I'm spraying on the trees. As you're setting fruit and you're forming seeds, that's an important time. As your buds are hardening off and preparing for winter, that's an important time. So as a fruit grower, I, I, I know that construct. Tomatoes, they go into bloom, they set fruit, they have seeds. This, the same thing applies. There's times when a charge of minerals can have a lot of value. Now, now some people go about that with dehydrated ocean water. And sea crop is an excellent product. It's made out in Washington on the west coast. I'm um, over here on the east coast. There's a lot of money charged to bring it to the east coast. So I haven't worked with this much. I, I think it's excellent, uh, but that's part of, of my choice. What I have done is I'm using an AEA product. That's Advancing EcoAg. That's John Kemp's company. Um, and it's called Micropack, and it contains tonic amounts of trace minerals. Um, so I, I'm not like saying I have a specific copper deficiency and I need to address that with a specific copper formulation. I'm just including Micropack in my pink spray, my petal fall spray, 10 days after petal fall. That's orchard calendar language. If you don't know it, you don't need to know it unless you plant a fruit tree. But that's those points of influence. And I'm adding that to the core holistic recipe. So I'm, I'm just building these constructs. 
You know, and, and all of this is about priming plant metabolism, just keeping it going as efficiently as it can go. So we get into rot dynamics. Um, you've seen tomatoes rot. If you've grown plums, peaches, cherries, you've seen those rot. That's called brown rot in the case of the stone fruits. And rot is something that if you went to its life cycle, you would learn it has a early season stage that gets the flower, reestablishes itself to get the fruit. So there's different points, times when you do certain things for that. Um, you know, at its most simplest, working with milk can be very helpful with rots, but also specifically mildews. So if you're a cucumber grower, powdery mildew, downy mildew, um, diluting whole milk, one to 10, is a way of reinforcing calcium, but also reinforcing lactobacilli that are on the surface of that plant. And we're gonna get into what they're doing in just a minute. Um, on the other hand, you can also take this a little further, and especially if you're dealing with fruit rots. And now I'm talking about the second stage of, of this particular pathogen. So that fruit rot lands on the cuticle. We've seen what that looks like. There's all those waxy crystals on the surface of the plant. And it in turn punches its way through. So it does that all the more readily in a weak cuticle. Why is it weak? Because plant metabolism isn't robust because the minerals aren't there to be driving the whole thing. Um, but even a strong cuticle, it can punch its way through. And beneath the cuticle are the epidermal cells of the plant itself, the surface of the leaf. Let's look at the surface a little deeper. Those epidermal cells become very strong barriers when they have sufficient calcium. So even if a rot gets through the crystals, if the cell wall is strong, you're not going to lose fruit to the same extent. There's still the space between the cells. <coughs> Silica forms what's called a phytolith and blocks that space. So the combination of robust lipids good calcium levels in the cell wall and silica phytolis between the space is another defense against rots. Now I'm talking on this level of depth because I'm a fruit grower and I, I face rot issues in a big way when it's a really wet summer. You know, I can keep this super simple for a home orchardist or a home gardener, but you also have seen rot if you're growing tomatoes. You, you know what I'm talking about. And this is one of the ways that we can boost it. So one of the plants, I'm going to talk now about three specific plants, and then we get to fermented plant extracts. One of the plants I utilize is horsetail. So horsetail is a, is a plant that goes back to the time of the dinosaurs. Back then it was maybe 200 feet tall. Today it's more on the order of 16 to 20 inches tall. And horsetail, the front, that first picture shows early in the season, it has like a fungal aspect to its reproductive system, but then it becomes more plant-like. And it looks, to some people, like a horsetail. And early in the season, the fronds are more vertical, and then they start to flatten around the end of May, early June. And when those fronds start to flatten, levels of silica go way up. So I'm giving you a little nuance of this plant. There's other sources of silica. Um, I was just in Australia. Bamboo grows there. It's rich in silica. If I'm in the Midwest and people tell me horsetail's not in, around here, I say, well, let's look at those swampy marsh grasses. There's, there's different choices of plants, so establish that idea. Another plant I use is stinging nettle. So I like, well, one, nettle is a crop, crop, cash crop for us because we sell medicinal herbs. In the green stage, Nettle is rich in all kinds of phytonutrients. That's why we dry it for tea. And one of those nutrients being calcium, which is why in the green stage, I'm gonna use that for the calcium influence. But when nettle goes to seed, it starts to build its levels of silica. So in the seeded stage, it's a great source of silica. <laughs> this is another presenter thing. Now I'm deciding I'm not gonna tell them about how I like to get stung by nettle because it helps my circulation and that's why I remain limber. 
I'm starting to edit because the clock is telling me I have 22 minutes left. One quick question. Um, our goats will only eat the um, skinny metal once it reaches the heavy seed stage. So they're looking for silica? Apparently. <laughs> I, I will never add goat psychiatrist to my title. <laughs> Then, then another plant I'm growing quite a bit of it in the orchard um, is comfrey, and there's many reasons why I do that, but it's an incredible source of calcium, you know? And this is a plant, all these plants, those stages are available when I need to be making a brew to deal with it. Now, long ago, maybe 15, even 20 years ago, I, I started working with herbal teas, and I would make a tea of nettle, a tea of comfrey, a, a tea of horsetail. I kept them separate. I'm not going to continue with that. But what I was doing then was learning from my wife, Nancy, who was becoming an herbalist. I was the herbal husband. I'm the one that she, you know, I was taking all these remedies for conditions I didn't even know I had. So I was just, <laughs> I was along for the ride trying to figure it out. And, and, and I had learned that, you know, you pour boiling water, over green plant tissue, that helps to break it down. Then if you fill the bucket and you let it ferment on the order of 10, 14 days, um, the constituents in the herb would be in that tea and I would apply it. And I, that's where I began my work with this. I also included garlic scapes because garlic scapes, if, well, in this part of the world we're all growing this kind of garlic, um, are the hard neck types, and the scape is, is, has the bulbils, it doesn't actually form seed, and you cut that off once it comes out of the, uh, the straight part and goes into the curl, so that you can grow a bigger bulb, and you know, some of that we make scape pesto with, um, some of that gets fed to our sheep to help with potential parasites, but some of it gets thrown in my teas, because I learned, as the herbal husband, that it's very challenging to give out one or two or three year old garlic when they have congestion, even though you know that garlic is one of the greatest expectorants that helps get clean, clear the lungs out. And you can try to trick an infant, but they catch on. But if, if you cut a clove, you dip it in a little olive oil and rub it on the base of their foot, within 10, 15 seconds, you're gonna smell garlic coming out of the pores up here. And this is because the organo sulfur compounds in garlic are very good at carrying through membranes. That's an important principle. I want to carry through the leaf membrane to get these nutrients into the plant. So today, I make a little bit more microbial version of the teas, and this is what are known as fermented plant extracts. So I'm working with the three herbs I mentioned. You might have different plants that you would be working with. Um, when I do what I do, it amounts to less than a dollar per gallon of spray. Now think of that five gallon container being shipped across the country that costs just as much to ship it as what you're paying the manufacturer. And here you are at home with plants that you grow on your farm and you're creating this concoction. And I, I now add effective microbes as part of this, not in a big way because this is a brew that's not aimed at when you make compost tea, it's aimed at filling that volume with microbes. I, my goal here is filling that water volume with nutrients. I'm, the microbes are going to assist the breakdown process, but I'm not trying to fill that volume with microbes. This is a food spray. I, I do have to tell you, I don't buy many body products, <laughs> um, but when I go into the bank of the post after, after I've made a holistic spray that includes these teas, there is a strong it, 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 I don't think it's too attractive. Uh, <laughs> there's an essence that comes with it, and I, I just accept that, but I just want you to know that that's out there. Um, your handout includes the specifics of the recipe. Your handout also includes the one analysis I spent the money for to make. And again, if I had a research budget, I could be doing more with this. But basically, you see the plants, think about the right stages for a calcium brew versus a silica brew. I, I mix these when I spray in the orchard, so you could mix these concoctions. I've also been adding to a 55-gallon drum two gallons of activated effective microbes. That's just going to enhance the microbial forces that are breaking down the plant material. Um, 
In the calcium brew, I add two gallons of whole milk. It doesn't have to be raw milk. It should be raw, a whole milk because you're interested in the fats. So I'm, I'm grabbing that principle as well. And then, then I have uh, used some rock powders. So gypsum is calcium sulfate. It's going to dissolve and offer up some calcium and sulfate into the brew. Um, in the case of silica, things like ground basalt dust is really ideal for silica. Uh, azomite clay, rock phosphite has silica. Uh, other rock dusts do to an extent. Was there a question? Well, last night, no, I haven't used it, so I'm. I, I'm, I'm um, the rock dust idea is just me supplementing. You know, I'm playing with it. And then, well, that concoction is in the barrel. I might stir it if I'm in the mood, but mostly I don't. I'm going to explain facultative microbes in a minute. Um, but after about 10 days, I fork out the plant material into the compost pile. This is what it looks like. All the green goodness has been absorbed into the, into the water, into the tea, into the brew. Um, it's really impressive. <laughs> and when I go to use it, I pour it through a quarter inch strainer because there's still particulates. I don't want to clog my sprayer. And when I pour it into the sprayer, I have a, a, a fine nylon mess basket as part of my pack tank, um, just because I, again, don't want to clog it with particulates. And yeah, oh no, no, wait. <laughs> At this point, when I've taken out the plant material, that's when I add the humic acids in one form because of that principle of chel chelating those nutrients so they stay in a bioavailable form. So these teas are something I'll use for over the course of typically 21 to 30 days, depending on how often I felt the need to spray. And I usually do two batches about 30 days apart, because that's, again, my orcharding and the intensity of certain things is there. It's, you're going to know your own moments of, of what crop you're working with. Another thing I picked up from John Kempf, and I find this very helpful, is manganese in a reduced form, in a chelated form, helps balance out the potassium factor, which has to do with uptake of calcium and magnesium. If there's too little potassium or too much potassium, then those other macronutrients are not necessarily as available to the plant. Calcium is really important. So is magnesium. So I want this balancer. So this is something I add a quart to that 100-gallon spray tank when I'm utilizing the teas, because this is my homegrown form of calcium. And manganese chelate helps in that respect. Now, there are variations on this theme. And if we were getting into, if we had a half day to go into this course, we, we would get a little more in depth about that phytochemistry involved with plants. And part of that immune function is called systemic acquired resistance. And it's based on the salicylic acid pathway. Don't have to know all that. But one of the remedies in herbal medicine, you have a headache, is to chew on a willow twig because willow is high in salicylic acid. Many plants have salicylic acid. You know, long ago, some chap named Bear chewed on a willow twig and thought, I can synthesize this, and you know that as Bear aspirin today. Anyway, making, fermenting willow twigs is going to give you high levels of salicylic acid, and that might be a remedy you have cause to use. Um, when you get into herbal medicine, you also learn that not all constituents are water soluble, some are more fat soluble, some require alcohol or vinegar to be brought out into the brew. So one of the products you can buy from Marone Innovations is um, Regalia. And you might be familiar with this or not, but what they're using is the, the root of the knotweed plant. And that's something you probably know a little bit about. And that is primarily because of the resveratrol for human medicine. When you're dealing with Lyme disease, that's one of the remedies you, you look towards. But it's also resveratrol is something that's better extracted with alcohol. So I have not been pouring my cider over knotweed roots to do this, but I'm, I just want to establish the idea that don't just think it's going to be a tea method. 
Similarly, um, Shazandra, which is a red berry noted for longevity and all kinds of, of good purposes. Um, Shazandra, if you're growing that, the prunings, the twigs and the leaves in a vinegar extract are very useful against brown rot. We're, we're just starting to learn a lot of these things, but I, I just want to hold on to that idea that lots of plants have lots of remedies. It's not just herbal medicine isn't just for humans. Out west, fruit growers are using hops resins to deal with bacterial canker on stone fruits and fire blight in apple and pear orchards. You know, my stories are mostly orchard related, but the, the same principle applies. This was useful against bacterial disease. Um, in the Midwest, you know, again, what, what's out there in my ecosystem? If Osage Orange was something I was dealing with, I would appreciate its antifungal properties, and I'd probably be using that as a plant remedy if I was dealing with fungal disease. So facultative nuance, let me see, 10 minutes. <laughs> Um, the organisms in effective microbes were selected because they have the ability to persist in an anaerobic environment and reproduce and as well as in an aerobic environment. So I want to shift gears if you're a compost tea brewer where you, you think about bubbling and you think about in 24 to 36 hours you spray that tea filled with microbes to we're working with organisms that can deal with a anaerobic environment. So when I mentioned how if I'm in the mood, I might stir my, my tea in those first 10 days once or twice, that's because I know the microbes I've introduced there have the ability to do what needs to be done despite it. So effective microorganisms was a combination of these facultative microbes put together by a Dr. Higa in Japan and basically it consists of photosynthetic bacteria, several species of lactobacillus, lactic acid bacteria, and then numerous yeasts, and go back to that picture with the floating balls and the little white threads coming out that, that make up a big portion of what's on the surface of plants. And um, various roles here, I mean photosynthetic bacteria actually utilize light to make nutrients available. So that's kind of like an ongoing part of that arboreal engine in terms of feeding the community. Lactic acid bacteria, you know if you've made pickles or sauerkraut that those foods don't spoil because there's high levels of lactofermentation that protect them. So that sounds like a good thing to have on the surface of the leaf. M lactic acid bacteria also plays a role in moving calcium and making it available along with phosphate into the leaf cell. So I want that player out there. And yeast I just think of as the crowd. You know, they're, they're, they're part of what's going on there. I talk about activating EM because I can purchase the mother culture. Again, if you're working with Korean natural farming methods, you can kind of create your own. But it becomes very economical because I can make 22 times as much volume by feeding blackstrap molasses to those microbes, so they in turn fill that volume of what I'm brewing. So this, this is where my microbes are coming from. And, and this is not complicated. I, I have a 55 gallon drum in my cellar, and early spring I have a heat belt that gets them going. If you're a home gardener, and this is gonna be your method of the microbe part of the recipe, you can use the mother culture that you get from the product manufacturer direct. But those five gallons that I buy for the season to work with three acres of orchard and an acre of medicinal herb garden in our food garden cost me approximately $290 with shipping. That's a lot. But when I take 22 times as much, the price drops to more like $4 a gallon and it becomes a very reasonable thing for me to do. Um, and I won't go through the basics because we don't have the time. But you can do compost tea. Again, I'm, I'm not strict about where you're getting it from, but that you realize that the biology is an important part of the story. Um, and the missing link here is not just the diversity of organisms, but the need to provide nutrients on an ongoing basis. Those fatty acids in the neem and the karanja and in the fish 
are really a core part of sustaining the arboreal food web so that you can get through the acid rain and the drought and the heat. And you know, I've learned, depending on where I am in the season, sprays are gonna be made either seven to 10 days apart depending on the pace of the rain. In the summer, I stretch it out to more like two weeks. And it's all about maintaining that colonization and also the nutrients that not only are absorbed through the whole pore scene we talked about, but are being assimilated and mineralized by an active food web on the surface of the plant, which the fungi can come and pick it up. It's really, I'm really excited about all this because it's just really cool stuff. Um, one of the principles in biodynamics is the farm as its own organism, that the more you can create fertility loops, utilize what you need to get ongoing nutrient cycling going in your soils, you know, animals are usually considered a part of that. The more you can do that, that's a goal. And I don't necessarily consider that I have to be totally self-sufficient from everyone else as much as I like to think of the farm community, the local farm community, as kind of that source of fertility. So I, I don't grow, I don't raise cows, I don't have dairy cows, but I have a local farmer who does, and, and there's swaps that can be made. But the more you get it locally, regionally, the better. And when I think about herbs growing on the farm, um, cultures with microbes that I brew, effective microbe piece, or be it compost tea, all of that unlooses the phylosphere. All of that leads to plant health. And you know, just to shift, I taught you some about disease. We're not obsessing on that. We're, we're obsessing on the health part because a healthy organism working with friends can do what it needs to do. And we have the ability to work with these remedies, these plant remedies, the holistic core recipe to sway things in our favor, whatever our goal is as a farmer, grower, or just nutrient-dense food advocate. And that is five minutes shy of where we end. So I can take some questions. <laughs> Are you, uh, or do you have any experience uh, flying uh, neem seed meal to the soil or insect excrement, insect grass, um, as an amendment and or uh, natural uh, systemic? So I, I have not bought neem seed cake to apply in the soil. If, if you were dealing with um, cutworms, you might consider something like that. Um, but I also think the application of the holistic core recipe is getting some of that into the soil. So I, again, these, when I spray, it's not always just the plant. Sometimes it's the soil, or it certainly drips from the plant. And the bit about using insect excrement, no, I've never encountered that idea. <laughs> So I haven't gathered it, and you'll, you could explain more to me, but let me, let me go to another question. Yeah, have you found the uh, rodent pressure <laughs> is lessened when you're using your fermented spray? I know that when I go out and spray, I'm not wearing a Tyvek suit, and then I get the pure guy essence, so I'm not bothered by rodents. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have a live problem with Know that I, I started this year spraying everything that they like to eat. Yeah. I had no, no pressure from them. As soon as I had an issue where I was down for three weeks, I stopped the spraying, vroom, the groundhogs came in and <laughs> you name it, they ate it. Yeah, I, I think like if you make an apple leaf taste like fish, deer aren't drawn to eat it. So I think there's some relevance to that. <laughs> Okay, so the, the first part of the question about do I chop up the plants, yes, that's like an herbal idea when you're making tea and, and two hours later you want to drink the tea. Th this plant material is in that 
drum for 10 days or so. And when you saw what it looked like in that picture on top of the compost, I don't need to spend the time chopping, so no on that. Then the whole idea of, of neem being antifungal. Um, that idea is trying to fit into the fungicide construct. So I don't think of neem as antifungal. Now, oils can smother fungi, and so when you buy a product called Trilogy, that's what's left after they've extracted out the azadiractins to make other products. They sell you the oily residues um, with the idea that that oily portion can smother, and, and they use that antifungal construct. It's not antifungal because I wouldn't be spraying it if it was hurting the fungi on the surface of my plant. It's a food for fungi when you think in a more broader, holistic sense. Yes? I said that sometimes I make sprays seven to ten days apart and then other parts of the season I extend it. And if, if we were doing an orchard workshop, I'd share this spray schedule specific to that. But just think of it this way. When the crop you're growing faces pressure from disease coming on and it's really rainy, you want to probably spray a little more often. And then when you're kind of beyond the active infection time, but you still want to boost metabolic processes, um, and it's not necessarily rainy, you can spread it out more. So that has to do with what I'm doing in that regard. So one more question, Mike. Uh, thank you very much for doing this, because this is extremely valuable. It's all made up. <laughs> <laughs>